We continue with our series, Living in Hope, and if your Bible is at close at hand, if you'll turn to page 1177 as we continue looking at 1 Peter, Living in Hope. And today I've called the message, Disciplined Godly Living. That's a picture um, of uh, Dr. Ben Carson and his remarkable story. You may have read it, called Gifted Hands. There's also a film called Gifted Hands. His is a fascinating story of rags to riches. He raised and has risen up to be one of the world's leading brain surgeons. In fact, he was also a nominee for the USA presidency. Imagine if a man of God like that had won and would be leading the country. A man of integrity, a man of godliness, a man of great leadership. Unfortunately, he was shouldered out by Donald Trump. How things could have been different. I suppose the real hero is not really um, Don Carson at all, but his mother. An illiterate mother who took her two sons in hand. Her husband wasn't present and she took her two boys in hand. They were drifting. They lived in the Bronx. She held down two jobs and they lived in a very run-down tenement building in the Bronx. And her sons were starting to drift with the other boys in the street. And she took her boys in hand. She uh, enrolled them in the local library and made them to start reading book after book after book. But this was the, the catch. When they read a book, they had to make a pricey, a summary of the book, and then deliver the pricey to their mother. And then they would go to the next book and the next book. And so she began to impact their minds. From those humble beginnings, Don Carson became a leading brain surgeon. He's still alive today, making a great impact and influence. But it was his mother who transformed his mind, shaped his mind, changed his behavior, taught him to value people, taught him that there was a better future than the alleyways of the Bronx. And he raised up and had a transformed life. Our passage today does exactly the same thing. In 1 Peter, we're going to read the encouragement for us to transform our minds, that our lives be transformed. We're going to read about obedience. We're going to read about a better hope that we all have. Now, if your Bible is open and you want to read with me, you'll see there in 1 Peter chapter 1 from verse 13. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy, says the Lord. Lord, we've read your word, and now we pray that you would be our teacher by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. A few things then I want to point out to you from our passage. The first thing is, to have a disciplined mind, to have a disciplined mind. You'll see it there in the passage. It said this, therefore prepare your minds for action. That's exactly what Mrs. Carson did. She changed the thinking of her boys by getting them to read broadly and expansively. And we need to guard our thinking. In fact, it's quite poetic, especially in the old King James Bible. It says this, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, I mean, get a laugh. That's hard to understand what that means. It simply means, 
tuck up your garments, tuck up your robes. You see, in those days, they would wear long flowing robes. And if the soldier went into warfare with a long flowing robe, his, his legs would be impeded and he, he couldn't move freely. But if he tucked up the ends of his robe into his belt, then he could run freely. And what our writer is saying, tuck up the ends of your mind. Bring your thinking into subjection. Or we would say, roll up your sleeves for action. Same idea. The idea is to conform your mind to be ready for action. In fact, Moses said a similar thing. Remember when the Israelites were about to leave Egypt and go towards the promised land? In Exodus 12 and verse 11, he said this, This is how you are to eat this last meal, with your cloaks tucked into your belt and sandals on your feet. The idea was to, to pull up the ends of your cloak that you could run freely. And the same idea is with our minds. We've got to bring our minds into subjection. Stop it being loose all over the place. You see, it's so important because the way we think is the way we are. The way we think will become the way we are. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. And what's more, sin starts in the mind. Sin starts in the mind. When you think of it for a moment, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, when we read about Eve's fall into sin, we read this. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took it. Note, she saw, she desired, she thought, and then she took. It started in the mind. It was the same for David. Remember when David sinned with Bathsheba and the whole godly man came crushing down? We saw in uh, 2 Samuel uh, 11 and verse 2, it says this, One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof of the palace, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. He looked, he longed, he lingered, he lusted, and he took her to his bed and committed adultery. It started in the mind. And here Peter writes to the scattered church. Remember the church of Jesus was scattered all over Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. In other words, all over modern Turkey. As it was scattered, they were living amongst ungodly people. And he says, although you live amongst ungodly people, pull up the ends of your mind that your mind might be disciplined if the word of God. Because if your mind is disciplined, your thoughts will be disciplined. We covered that um, last year when we look at Philippians. There's a classic passage in Philippians, which I'm sure you know well. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, Finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See, the Bible makes it quite clear that we must guard our thinking. In fact, it goes on to say, therefore prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled. See that word self-controlled? Other translations, especially the King James, says, be sober-minded. I quite like that. Be sober-minded. Last night I was woken up at 12 o'clock. I only got to bed again at 2 o'clock because some savages down the road were having a party. And they were carrying on. I actually got dressed and went amongst them to find out what was going on. I didn't get involved, thankfully, but I just wanted to see what is all the rockers about. And they were drunk and falling around all over the place. And this morning they've left an unholy mess in our yard. And I'm going to deal with them when I get home. They were unruly. They were out of control. And so the Bible says, don't let your mind be drunk, but let your mind be sober, be in control. One of the authors I read in preparing this message said this, it indicates a calm state of mind that evaluates things correctly, 
so that it is not thrown off balance by false deceptive ideas. Christians must think carefully, must think clearly. I need not remind you that we live in an age like has never been before, a visual age. There's visual things that, that have an onslaught to our mind all the time today. Screens everywhere, TV screens, phone screens, tablet screens, advertising screens, screens everywhere. It's, it's after your mind because it knows if it can change your thinking, it'll change your behavior. And so the Bible says, guard your mind. Job, one of the oldest books in the Old Testament, says this, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully on a woman. What a great thing to do. I have made a covenant. Now, I wonder if that needs to be put above our television or that one I read. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is praiseworthy, think about such things. What are you watching, friends? What are you viewing? The Bible says what goes in, junk in, will be junk out. Guard your minds and hear from a grandfather. Guard the minds of your children and your grandchildren. Watch what they view. Set standards, set disciplines, because what goes into the mind will come out of the life exactly what the Bible says therefore prepare your minds for action be sober minded the second discipline he brings to us is the discipline of expecting a better future looking for a better future that's exactly what Mrs. Carson did to her boys Instead of letting them just grow up in the Bronx, with the Bronx, and with all the other wild kids, she said, no, there can be a better future. You can do better than what we have. And she taught her boys to think of a better and a brighter future. And she says, set your mind, set your hope fully on the grace to be revealed. Look higher than the skyline she said and we need to fix our hope on greater things than this world and the passing parade we need to set our gaze on better things we need to hope for better things one of my favorite uh, athletes is um, Eliza McCartney she just oozes a a lovely radiance whenever she's interviewed she's smiling she's boy I don't know if she's a Christian but wow she just she just oozes a confidence. And that's a picture of her about to do a pole vault. I think she pole vaults over four meters. An amazing height. I'm sure someone will correct me with the right distance afterwards. But she really, she flies with that pole. And what she does, she focuses. Her mind is set. Her body is set. She's absorbed. Everything else fades but that jump to clear it. And that's the idea here in Scripture. Set your mind, set your hope fully on the grace to be revealed. We've got to watch what our hope is set on. Our hope just mustn't be set on the passing parade of this world. Our hope is set on the things of God and what God wants for us. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 says this, But as citizens of heaven... Hello? Not citizens of New Zealand or South Africa or wherever you come from, but as citizens of heaven, we've got a new citizenship. We carry a new passport. But as citizens of heaven, we eagerly wait a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus, who by his power will establish all things under his control. And again, a book, in the book of the Revelation, chapter 1, look, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him. And even his last words in the Bible, even so I'm coming soon. You see, that's the expectation the Christian has. Not squeezing this world as though we've got to get the last drop from it, but we look higher. Our vision is set on Christ and the things of eternity. Peter wrote two letters. His second letter reads like this in chapter 3. Since everything will be destroyed... What kind of people ought we to be 
we ought to live holy, godly lives as we look forward to the day of his coming. As we look forward, longing for the things of God. Not the passing parade of this world, but the things of God. Remember Jesus said, Do not store up for yourself treasure on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. What I find interesting there, Jesus says, where thieves break in and steal. The, the original Greek is, where thieves break in or break through. Ram raiding. Ram raiding in the Bible. You see, they lived in mud houses. So you didn't have to break the window because there was no window to break. But you'd break a hole in the wall. You'd ram raid the wall and break into the person's house. So Jesus says, don't store up for yourself treasure on earth where ram raiders will break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. We're to think higher than this earth, higher than our homes and our cars and, and the stuff that clutters our life. His name was Arthur Malcolm Stacy. It's a picture of him there. He grew up in very depressed situation in Australia. By the age of 12, he was already an alcoholic. His parents were alcoholics, and he was an alcoholic with them. Drifted through life, thrown out of school, eventually started work in the mines, in the coal mines. And in those days, in the early 1940s, the standards were far from what they could be. It wasn't long until he got some kind of lung disease from working in the mines. Uh, the war began to break out, it was pre-war days, so he joined up, but he didn't last long in the military because of his lung condition. So they threw him out the military as well. And he became a ward of the state. A ward of the state. And he just drifted on the streets, living and surviving. Until 1932, he heard a preacher preached the gospel of the hope that Christ gives and the preacher mentioned eternity forever with the Lord, eternity that word eternity etched itself into his mind and for 35 years true story for 35 years Arthur Malcolm Stacy wrote the word eternity on the pavements, on the steps, by the post office. Everywhere he went, every day, he would write the word eternity. In fact, um, there is a, a, a cast statue of him in Sydney to remember with the words eternity. And at the 2000 celebration, they wrote the word eternity on the Sydney Harbour Bridge in memory of him. He was obsessed with the fact that life doesn't just end as we know it. There is an eternity either with God or away from God. Either saved or lost eternity. And it's exactly what our passage is saying. Set your hope on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Guard your mind. Guard your hope. And then thirdly, the passage tells us that God our behavior or discipline our behavior to be obedient. You'll see verse 14 says, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. As obedient children. Again, that, that's exactly what Mrs. Carson did. She taught those two big boys of hers to obey. She was half their heart and half their weight. But a feisty little lady who taught her big boys the importance of obedience, the value of obedience. And here the writer says, as obedient children. In fact, in the original, it's turned the other way around, as children of obedience. And it has the idea of that we are marked as the obedient ones, that the thing that marks our life is obedience to God's word. We are children of... 
we used to be children of disobedience. If you read in um, Ephesians chapter 2, that, that first ch- uh, passage that tells us of our waywardness, children of disobedience, it says, but now things have changed. Now in Christ we've become marked with obedience. Our desire is to obey God and to obey his word. Now that we're saved, we obey. That was the same as the Israelites. Remember God said, I chose you not because you were more numerous than other people. I chose you to be my special people that you might obey me. Obedience must mark our lives. In one, Romans chapter 1 and verse 5 it says, Through him we receive grace and apostleship to be called from the Gentiles to be the obedience of the faith. You can't separate, you, you can't separate faith from obedience. If we are people of the faith in Christ, obedience marks our life. Jesus said, if you love me, go to church. If you love me, give. If you love me, sacrifice. No, no, no. If you love me, obey. Don't tell me how often you go to church. Don't tell me how much you give. Don't tell me how much you do. Don't tell me how much you love singing and how much you love the people of God. Tell me how much you obey. See, obedience marks the life of the godly. Jesus said, Not all all those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter heaven, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. I wonder if I'm speaking to somebody and God has been saying that some change needs to come in your life or some new start needs to come in your life or some certain thing needs to be put down from your life which is holding you back and God has been saying it again and again and again. The thing is, will you obey? The mark of godliness is not how much I do and how much I believe but how much I obey. I think too much this is our lives. In that picture we see a man all tied up with so much clutter that it's holding him back. I think sometimes we need to put a whole lot down that we take the life of simple obedience. Do not conform, it said there in the passage, but obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Interesting, the word ignorance. Once we were ignorant. Once we didn't know better. Before we were saved, we didn't know better. Uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, when we get to it, verse 18, it says, For we have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, uh, through the living and enduring word of God, which has been passed on to you, um, not as your forefathers did, in ignorance. There was once a time we were ignorant of what... But no one in this church, no one listening to this message can say you're ignorant now. God calls us to obedience. And he's seeking for you and I to be people of obedience. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And then the last thing that Peter calls uh, his people to um, here in this passage, he says, verse 15 and 16, but, and I think this is the heart of the passage, by the way, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For as it is written, be holy because I am holy. Remember the church was scattered? Scattered in an ungodly environment, in an unholy environment, and yet they had to live separately and differently. Again, that's what Mrs. Carson did for her boys. She wouldn't let her boys wander on the streets. She wouldn't let her boys go in the alleyways. She wouldn't let the boys go to the arcades. She wouldn't let her boys run with the other riffraff in the Bronx. No, no. She kept her boys separate. She brought them out of that environment and she taught them differently. You see, the word holy is from the Greek word hagios, which simply means separate, different, set aside. You and I are the bride of Christ. We are set aside for the Lord Jesus. I've been set aside for my wife for 43 years and her for me. 43 years of devotion to each other. 
no one else in our relationship, just the two simply devoted to one another for life. That's what Christ calls us to, to be devoted, to be holy to the Lord. Holiness is not an attitude. Holiness is not a, a shine on your face. Holiness is devotion to Christ. The Bible says, since everything will be destroyed in the end, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to be holy, set aside, separate for him. Make every effort, the Bible says, to live at peace with all men and be holy. Because without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. So bless my soul, you, you can't sit in this church today and say, well, as far as holiness goes, I, it's not really for me. I don't really like that part. The Bible says without holiness, you won't see God without being separate. You know, there are too many Christians who want to be chameleons, who just want to blend in, just fit in, want to just be a camouflage Christian. They don't want to stand out. They don't want to be known as, as those who belong to Christ. No, no, no. Well, let's just fit in. Let's just be like a dead fish that floats with the tide. It's so easy. Just, just fit in, say as little as possible. Just go, go with the tide. Christians are different. We're holy. We stand up. We stand out. And you say, well, Ben, it's all very well because in the first century when they wrote this, it was very easy to be holy. It's so difficult today. Our lives are so different. Our lives are so hard. And there's so much sin all around us. They had it easy in those days. No way. You think we've invented anything new? Of course we haven't. Note this is written in Galatians, one of the early books of the New Testament telling the Christians on how they are not to behave. Galatians 5 9, from 19. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, homosexuality, hatred, dissension, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, faction, envy, drunkenness, orgies, it's exactly where we live today. They had the same circumstance as we had today. They were called to be separate, to be holy, to belong to Christ, the bride of Christ. And you and I are called to be the bride of Christ as well. I wonder if you noticed that passage that was uh, read to us and you maybe thought um, the wrong passage was read because we always read the passage for the sermon before I preach and yet we read Colossians. And the reason I got that passage read in Colossians because it summarizes exactly what we've had to say today. Let me read the words again. Colossians 3 from verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart and mind on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hid with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him. Same thing. God your mind, God your obedience, God your behavior, and God your holiness. As we walk away, what has Peter told us? As we live as the diaspora, the spread people of God in this wicked society, how do we live? Number one, guard your mind. Guard your mind for God. Number two, be people who have a sense of eternity, a better hope than this world promises. Number three, discipline your behavior. Be obedient obedient to God. And number four, our lifestyle must be one of holiness. I wonder if you noticed just a little while ago at Sylvia Park, if you have been there to Sylvia Park, near the end of summer, there was a fun fair set up in the park. Did you, did you see that in the car park? It's a big fun fair set up. Well, I saw the fun fair and and then just a few days ago I was travelling along the motorway and I saw some trucks and they had packed up the fun fair and they were taking it elsewhere and I began to reflect and I thought well that's just like the world a little game here and a little game there a little bit of fun here and a little bit of fun there and we pack it all up and we go away and it's all so transitory this world is just offers us things that are so transitory that give no lasting hope and that pass away. 
But the things of God are not a fun fair. They're in eternity, forever with the Lord, in the home beyond all homes, to see the face of Christ and to, and to, to live a life that counts, a life for God. God, your mind. God, your hope. God, your discipline. And God, your life to be holy. Let's bow in prayer. Just a moment for you to reflect some very wise counsel from the word of God in the days in which we live. Have you been guarding your mind? Is your mind a sober mind? Have you been setting your affection on the passing parade, the fun ground? Or have you been setting your affection on the heavenly things? Are you obedient? Do you conform your life to the image of Christ and live to please him? Is there some measure of separation in your life? Or do you so blend in that no one even knows you're a Christian? Lord, thank you for the counsel of your word. Give us grace to apply these truths to our lives. And for Jesus' sake, amen.